Friends, at this time we are going to begin the services for Sandy Bank. If you have a cell phone or a pager, I would ask for you to please take a moment to turn it off or place it in the silent mode. And we welcome and thank those of you who are joining us online through Zoom. While your presence might not be here physically, the family certainly is grateful and acknowledges your presence virtually. Officiating today's services will be Rabbi Isaac Serrata from Macomb Solel Lakeside. Death has taken our beloved Sandy Bank. Our friends grieve in their darkened world. In their silence, there is lamentation. In tears, there is loneliness. Lost in sorrow, may they find the presence of loving friends. Heal them, O oh God. Be with them. For Sandy's love that united us in life in which death cannot sever. For his companionship that we shared along life's path, in which continues through the tenderness of memory for the gifts of his heart and mind that brought us joy and happiness and are now a precious remembrance. For all these things and more, we give our thanks to God. So in this time of grief, we listen to the voice of our sacred scriptures. They bring us the ever new message of God's nearness. They tell us of our kinship with our creator in light as in darkness, in joy as in sorrow, in life as in death. So we read words from the Psalms that tell us what it takes to abide in God's house, what it means to live a good life. The words of Psalm 15, and they sound to me as if they were written for Sandy. God, who may abide in your house, who may dwell in your holy mountain, those who are upright, who do justly, who speak the truth, who do not slander others or wrong them or bring shame upon them, who scorn the lawless, but honor those who revere God, who give their word and come what may do not retract, who do not exploit others. Those who live in this way shall never be shaken. They shall live in the house of God forever. We read too the words of Psalm 23, which are probably the most famous poem in the world. They've been translated into every language they remind us of that message that God gives us a spirit within that goes back to God when we die. It also reminds us that all of us go through the valley of the shadow of death. It's the price we pay for loving other people is that one day we will have to grieve for them and mourn them. But it reminds us too that this is a valley that we pass through. We can't skip it, but we do go through it and come to the other side from the depths of mourning to the heights of life. And so we say these ancient words together in the English, it's in the brochure. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We read familiar words from the book of Ecclesiastes that remind us that for everything there's a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to throw stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to discard, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. Indeed, this is a time to speak, a time for us to remember Sandy, what he meant in our lives. It's my honor to 
call on his son, John, to come up first and share a few words in memory of his dad. It's a little surreal for me. All of a sudden, I'm the guy in the front row. Thank you all for coming. Your presence and decision to attend Sandy's funeral will always be remembered by our family. Thank you especially for your kind words of comfort and support over the last several days. They have given me strength and guidance during this difficult time. Sandy would be pleased with the turnout. He always liked being the center of attention and being talked about. Nothing ever prepares you for the loss of a parent. It's traumatic no matter how old you are. There's a huge and painful emptiness inside of me. The loss is acute and piercing. Sandy died in hospice at home in his new mechanized recliner in the loving embrace of his family. I feel blessed that I was, be able to be, that I was able to be by Sandy's side as he passed, I have lost the mainstay of my life. Sandy was my role model in life as a businessman, as a father, as a husband, as a contributing member of society, and most of the time as a human being. He always strived to be the best he could be in these various different realms and achieve the lofty goals he set for himself. He taught me how to be a man. As the oldest son, my relationship with Sandy was intense and symbiotic. He had high expectations for me, and I felt heightened levels of responsibility. As two alpha males, we quite frequently locked horns. But undergirding our relationship was a deep love, mutual admiration and respect, fierce family loyalty, and sense of shared purpose in life. We were always a team. From an early age, my father had a high degree of trust and confidence in me. At age eight, he taught me how to reconcile his bank account, <laughs> which actually became one of my monthly chores until I left for college. He had me chart his stock holdings on a 14-column accounting paper spreadsheet back in the days when stocks traded in one-eighth increments. Throughout his life, he made sure that I and Doug knew every aspect of his financial affairs and were acquainted with his, with his advisors. Sandy was a great financial mentor to Doug, and I, to Doug and me, and it was paramount to him that we were financially savvy and self-sufficient. Sandy's business and professional accomplishments were well known and were a source of great satisfaction and pride to him. He was especially proud of his career as a CPA and his role in building Bernstein & Bank into one of the largest locally owned Chicago accounting firms. After I graduated law school and moved back to Chicago in 1984, Sandy and I partnered closely in a variety of real estate and business ventures. More meaningful to me was the way Sandy, Doug, and I ended up turning Phoenix Electric into a family enterprise. I'm touched by all the Phoenix employees who showed up today to pay their respects. Thank you. Without question, the supreme highlight of my business career has been the honor and privilege of working closely with my father and brother over the last 30 years. Our business and personal lives became inextricably intertwined. All three of us worked hard to make the relationships between us function optimally in both arenas. We put our egos aside and elevated the importance of our personal relationships above making money, status, or being right. We constructed our business and personal lives into a seamless web of deserved trust. This, more than anything else, is why we are such a close-knit family. However, what underlay all of Sandy's professional and monetary success was more important and worthy of emulation. 
It was the high degree of integrity and honesty with which he always conducted his business affairs and the fair, generous, and respectful way in which he treated people. This enabled him to sleep well at night and hold his head high. Fiscal prudence, self-discipline, hard work, tenacity, focus on goal attainment, and his refusal to take no for an answer were the hallmarks of Sandy's business career and personal life. Every family has its own family legends, and one of ours is how on the day after the great Chicago snowstorm of 1967, with the city closed, the roads impassable, and all modes of transportation shut down, Sandy attempted to get to work by walking all the way to the Highland Park train station, only to discover that the trains were not running either. This was quite a testament to his perseverance and drive to succeed. Perhaps Sandy's most admirable character trait was that he was able to put his professional success in perspective and never let it dominate his personal ideals. Building a strong family life was critical to him. As a father, Sandy rarely sacrificed his personal or family time for the sake of making more money or advancing his career. He was a dedicated father who always put his family first. I remember that being home for dinner was vital to him and the efforts he made so that we could have dinner together as a family at six o'clock most every night. Sandy treated family vacations as sacred, never calling the office and very rarely receiving phone calls. Sandy always made an effort to be involved in Doug's and my life and do fun father-son activities together. From taking us to amusement parks on weekends, we were young, to taking two-week family vacations in Hawaii every Christmas, to playing nightly gin rummy games, to wrestling with us in the basement until we became too big for him to push around, to having rib-eating contests at dinner, to taking us to various major league football, baseball, basketball, and hockey games around town, to playing catch and basketball with us in the backyard, to attending our various school sporting events. He knew all our friends well and always asked about them. Even after we were out of college, we went to eight consecutive Super Bowls together, the highlight, of course, being the 1986 Bacchanalia in New Orleans. Prioritizing family and family life are attributes of his personality that I admire and have incorporated into my own life and into my relationship with my children. As a young father, he had a fiery intensity, unrelenting drive to succeed, frenetic energy and competitiveness that he instilled in Doug and me. He always wanted Doug and me to be the best that we could be, be tough, be fighters, and understand that the world can be a very unforgiving place. He was supportive of us in our myriad endeavors and journeys, even if he didn't always agree with them and, or understand them. Although most of the time, it took a lot of persuasion and counseling from our mom to convince him. Sandy had a lifelong devotion to learning. He was a closet intellectual and a voracious reader. His bookshelves were overflowing with everything from Elmore Leonard mysteries to philosophical treatises. I finally remember the mental games Doug and I played with him growing up, naming all the state capitals, memorizing the US presidents in order, recalling arcane baseball trivia, and reciting Robert Service poems. Lifelong learning, education, and continuous self-improvement are family cornerstones. Sandy was overwhelmingly generous. In his later years, he took immense pleasure in devoting large amounts of his time and money to his two major philanthropic passions, his beloved Washington University and the Chicago Hearing Society. As a husband, his 64 years of marriage speaks volumes about his loyalty and devotion to mom. Renee and Sandy certainly had their share of loud disagreements, but in the end, the respect and love they had for each other were strong enough to obviate any topical disputes. Family closeness and harmony were so important to Sandy. To his credit, Sandy changed and grew as a human being as he got older. His attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors evolved. 
from dogmatic, ego-driven, win-lose, black and white, and feeling that he always had to be right and be the tough guy. He became much more compassionate, empathetic, understanding, and self-aware. <clears throat> it served to make him a more complete human being and deepen the connections to his loved ones. As I have gotten older and become a husband and a father myself, I have grown, and, I have grown to truly appreciate how Sandy lived his life with morality, character, determination, loyalty, understanding, gratitude, and love for his family. His desires to keep a low profile, live within his means, not accumulate material possessions, and not live ostentatiously are values that I respect and have abided by my entire life. This past Friday, as Sandy was nearing the end, he shouted out, my boys, my boys, I want to see my boys. Doug and I rushed to his side. He told us that he could die a happy man. He had lived a great life and how nothing in his life <laughs> had brought him greater joy or pride than Doug and me. Between uncontrolled sobbing, Doug and I were then able to tell him all that he meant to us, how much we loved him, and how proud we were to be his sons. It was our final goodbye. I'm immensely grateful to have had that opportunity. Sandy's legacy lives on in Doug and me, our wives, Ellen and Nancy, our children, Nikki, Jordy, Cara and Andy, his niece, Myra, nephews, Elliot and Alan and their families, his philanthropic pursuits, and in the numerous lives he touched in his journey through life. Dad, for 63 years, I knew that wherever I was in life and whatever I was doing, you were in my corner cheering me on. So long, Dad. I love you, and I will miss you terribly. I'll see you on the other side of this life. Rest in peace. Psalm 90 teaches us something that Sandy knew in his life, that we need to make every day in this world count, and that we do what we can to become wise, to attain a heart of wisdom. And this psalm also tells us that a full life is three score, year, three score years and ten are given strength four score years. Sandy beat that by a dozen. So we read these words that remind us to make each day count. O oh God, you've been the, our refuge in every generation. Before the mountains came into being, before you brought forth the earth and the world from eternity to eternity, you are God. You return us to dust. You decree return you mortals. For in your sight a thousand years are as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You engulf us in sleep. We are like grass that renews itself. At daybreak it flourishes anew, at dusk it withers and dries up. The span of our life is three score years and ten are given strength four score years. The best of those years have trouble and sorrow. They pass by speedily. We are left in darkness. Teach us, therefore, to number our days that we may attain a heart of wisdom. Turn to us, O God. Show mercy to your servants. Satisfy us at daybreak with your steadfast love that we may sing for joy all our days. Let your deeds be seen by your servants, your glory by their children. May your favor, O God, be upon us. Establish the work of our hands, that it may long endure. Doug, I'd like to invite you to come up. Your words as well. Thank you, Rabbi John. Very nice. And this may be the uh, younger brother's lighthearted perspective. Um, <laughs> Dad always told us all you can do is your best, so I'll do my best. <clears throat> my father was a great man, 
a great son, a great husband, a great grandfather, a great uncle, a great great uncle, a great friend, and he'd be the first to tell you a great tennis player. <laughs> and of course, Sandy was a great father, the best. Thanks to Sandy and Renee, I have nothing but fond memories of growing up in what can only be described as idyllic circumstances. My father was very successful in multiple business ventures and enterprises, and yet he always, and I mean always, put his family first. It was very important to Sandy to include John and me in almost everything that he did. My dad was a great trencherman, and as John said, he was always home every night at dinner at six o'clock, a tradition that I gladly continue to this day. And boy, oh boy, what dinners we had. As a CPA, my dad represented several restaurant and food service clients. And accordingly, he would bring home prime steaks, chops, and ribs. And my mother, a gourmet cook, by the way, prepared these into a feast. And this was not just on special occasions. This was basically every night. I don't know a lot of young kids that were eating escargot at family dinners, but that's what my mom served. And one of my dad's favorite stories, and he repeated it often, was when the family was at one of our special restaurants, Frenchie's, up at Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and they ordered the escargot. Apparently, the waiter told the head chef, and he came out of the kitchen to personally meet and shake the hand of the six-year-old who had ordered the snails. <laughs> My dad loved that story. As John said, we took marvelous family vacations to Europe, the American West, and of course, Hawaii every Christmas, but never on spring break. That was tax season. Um, as John said, our dad never missed any of our sporting events. He was always there. Um, as John also said, professional sports were a huge part of our life with our father. I spent my childhood going to Bulls and Blackhawk games with my dad and my mom, which is where I learned to smoke and swear at the old Chicago Stadium. <laughs> Growing up on the South Side, my dad was a lifetime diehard White Sox fan, yet my first days of Wrigley and many days thereafter were, of course, with my dad, my mom, and John. And one of the great memories of my life was when John and I took my dad to Sox Park to watch them win game two of the 2005 World Series. Sandy was a huge boxing fan. And in the earliest days of what was known as closed circuit television, dad, John, and I saw the first Ali Frazier heavyweight title fight in a small hotel room. I believe it was the Purple Hyatt. And then several years later, we watched the second Ali Frazier fight at the Lincoln Village Theater. How Lincolnwood became the epicenter of uh, closed circuit boxing, I have no idea. <laughs> but we were there. But my oldest and most enduring sports memories, of course, are the Chicago Bears. I was eight years old when Sandy began taking John and I to see the Chicago Bears, first at Wrigley Field and then at Soldier Field. My father, never a pious man, did not hesitate to pull us out of Sunday school early so they would not miss the kickoff. I apologize, Rabbi, but thank you. <laughs> The Chicago Bears in the 1970s were awful. One of my father's favorite lines was that he feared that I would develop an inferiority complex by attending Bears games. <laughs> Nevertheless, we continued to go to every game, year in and year out, with the miserable weather and the lousy teams. My memories are dominated by frigid temperatures, temperatures excuse me, and grossly unskilled play. The thought that I was being punished for some unbeknownst transgression did cross my young mind. But I treasured the Sunday ritual of going to the Bears games with John and my dad. Three decades later, I was blessed to be able to continue this tradition with my own two sons. As John said, and quite remarkably actually, my father took our entire family to every Super Bowl, from Super Bowl 16 to Super Bowl 23. Well, actually, my mom set out the one that was played in Detroit. But the absolute highlight of my sporting life with my dad is, unquestion is unquestionably attending Super Bowl 20 in New Orleans with my whole family and it is one of our greatest family memories. Not only did we celebrate our beloved Bears winning the Super Bowl, but I witnessed my father successfully dispute a room service charge during our checkout at the New Orleans Sheridan. <laughs> Upon reviewing the bill for the two rooms he had reserved, or more accurately, after meticulously studying each line item for an improper charge or a misplaced decimal, he saw something he did not like. After a double take, he indignantly hands the bill back to the clerk to dispute, really to summarily reject a massive room service charge. He emphatically assures the clerk that this is a clear error and that some horrible mistake has been made. There was an extended standoff, but the clerk finally acquiesced 
In retrospect, he never stood a chance, and the room service charge was removed. It was an epic Sandy Bank performance. The fact that the room service charge may have legitimately come from his sons and certain individuals in this room is of no importance. As you may have surmised from the Super Bowl room service story, my dad was assertive, always stood up for himself, and never took no for an answer. My dad and I would frequently go to McClure Court Sports Center and then dinner at Gene and Giorgetti's. And one of my most indelible memories is the night, the night Gene's was jam-packed with the usual crowd of mockers, hustlers, politicians, gangsters, plus a whole bunch of conventioneers. And my dad was told that there was not a table to be had. I assure you, that was not the end of the conversation. <laughs> my dad had a heated discussion with the maitre d'. Money may have exchanged hands, and the next thing I know, three waiters are frantically clearing out all the hanging coats in a coat nook on the second floor, and then putting a table in the now empty nook where we eventually enjoyed our shrimp cocktails, New York strips, medium rare, and cottage fries. Apropos to nothing, I guess, I will tell you that my father went to bed most nights at 10.30 after the evening lose like clockwork, and he would often have me read his favorite poems to him while he was in bed. And a little contrary to, to John, I'm not talking about Eliot or Auden, Wordsworth or Whitman, but Edward Arlington Robinson's Miniver Cheevy and Richard Corey, and his all-time favorite poem, Rudyard Kipling's If. And his favorite line was, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same. When John and I told Sandy that we were thinking about selling Phoenix Electric, he said, over my dead body, which of course brings us all here today. <laughs> my dad had a marvelous sense of humor, and that joke was for him. As John so eloquently said, my dad was exceedingly generous and charitable to his family and the causes that meant a lot to him, the time and passion he spent serving the Chicago Hearing Society in particular was admirable and brought Sandy a great sense of satisfaction and pride. If you visit their website, you will see a smiling picture of Sandy Bank, a picture of Sandy Bank smiling which tells the whole story. The younger Sandy Bank was not averse to raising his voice and letting his opinion know. And God help you if you put an S at the end of bank or were late for anything. But as John said, he certainly mellowed over the years. I like to say it's really a tale of two Sandys. And it has been my greatest pleasure and privilege to have had my dad in my life for so long. I feel incredibly blessed to have been able to spend so much time with Sandy in my adult life. My dad was adamant about having lunch with John and me on a weekly basis. And this became a very pleasant, and rewarding ritual for all of us. I am hoping that you will read John in my upcoming memoir, Wednesdays with Sandy. <laughs> my, my dad was so magnanimous with these lunches that he would occasionally, occasionally, let us eat at restaurants that did not offer let us entertain you points. <laughs> he loved those points. My dad was an outstanding grandfather who made the effort to spend as much time as possible to meaningfully interact and engage with all his grandchildren. I'll let the grandkids speak for themselves, but I do want to highlight that my dad was especially proud that his father played college football at Washington University, Sandy's beloved alma mater. Accordingly, it was one of his greatest joys to fly out to Pomona College to watch Jordy suit up and play football for the Sage Hens. The first bank to play college football in 100 years, as he was fond of saying, and he said it often. That joy was only surpassed, and this is one of the absolute highlights of Sandy's life, by having been able to hand Andy Bank his diploma during Andy's graduation ceremony from, you guessed it, Washington University, the third generation of Bank to have so graduated. And maybe the best example of my father's character, loyalty, dedication, and compassion was his heroic efforts to care for my mother after her emergency surgery in Florida in 2020. At 90 years old, he took over every household chores, chores that he had never done before, chores that he never knew existed, and became my mom's personal chauffeur, taking her to all her doctor's appointments, as well as managing all of my mom's medication. My dad was my hero, and I loved him very much. He was serious and intimidating at times, but also funny, smart, loyal, compassionate and generous, 
and he loved his family and friends with an unyielding intensity. I just can't believe that he's no longer in my life. So if you find yourself at a restaurant in the next several days, please raise a glass. My dad was a man who certainly enjoyed a good pour and toast Sandy Bank for a life well lived. And remember, 20% on the food, 10% on the booze, and never tip on the tax. <laughs> A modern poet has written, birth is a beginning and death a destination, but life is a journey, a going, a growing from stage to stage, from childhood to maturity and youth to age, from innocence to awareness and ignorance to knowing, from foolishness to discretion and then perhaps to wisdom, from weakness to strength or strength to weakness and often back again, from health to sickness and back we pray to health again from offense to forgiveness, from loneliness to love, from joy to gratitude, from pain to compassion and grief to understanding, from fear to faith, from defeat to defeat to defeat and to looking backward or ahead, we see that victory lies not at some high place along the way, but in having made the journey, stage by stage, a sacred pilgrimage. Birth is a beginning and death a destination but life is a journey, a sacred pilgrimage made stage by stage, from birth to death to life everlasting. It's my honor to call Sandy's grandchildren, Jordan, Andrew, Nikki, and Kara, to come up and say a few words together. As Sandy's grandchildren, we're here to celebrate a man who stopped at nothing to celebrate us. Though we stand today in the quiet gravitas of a chapel, we begin our story of Sandy in the polar opposite location. Dave & Buster's, for those who've escaped its siren's call, is a restaurant, bar, arcade chain that exists at the unholy intersection of Disney World and Caesars Palace Casino. The dim light is broken by a sea of flashing synthetic bulbs, beckoning any child in attendance to blow their money on skee-ball, 1980s video games, and quite literal slot machines. As a collective, us grandchildren have been to Dave & Buster's roughly 100 times. Our collective parents have taken us a total of once. <laughs> the remaining 99 visits were facilitated, sponsored, and celebrated by Sandy and Renee Bank. Grandpa Sandy would do anything for his grandchildren, and that includes going, time and again, to a modern-day monument to conspicuous consumption. For me, Grandpa would go above and beyond, spending hours combing through Grandma's TV guide, parsing channels, learning new technology, in order to record the season finale of Digimon, so that when I slept over, I wouldn't miss the epic conclusion. Though you can't tell by looking at me, I was the aforementioned football player of the grandchildren. <laughs> um, and my grandfather flew across the country in his 80s to watch me play college football, or more accurately, to watch me stand on the sideline and watch college football. <laughs> he sat for an hour and 38 minutes as I shook in my seat laughing at Osmosis Jones, watching Chris Rock as an anthropomorphized white blood cell fight bacteria in Bill Murray's body. He even mustered a smile at its conclusion, pretending to like the film that was certified rotten on Rotten Tomatoes. In all that time, Sandy was the driven, loving, gregarious man you all know. Through osmosis, Sandy's proclivity for soliloquy, his love for saccharine speeches, has manifested in me. It's his spirit I embody when I stand up for an impromptu toast or go over time on a eulogy. <laughs> so I appreciate how open he was with us in his thoughts and his emotions, even as he embraced oversharing later in his life. I imagine there is nary a person in this room 
that hasn't shared a moment with Sandy over the past decade in which he reflected on his latest bowel movement. <laughs> but most of all, <laughs> he always shared his pride in his grandchildren. Grandpa was effusive in expressing his pride in us grandchildren. Grandpa had been building my self-esteem since I was a young child. He always made us feel loved and accomplished and heard. I fondly remember trips to the Children's Museum at Navy Pier, just the two of us, where I would spend hours in a jungle gym meant for kids much older and much taller than me. Upon returning home and for years to come, Grandpa would brag to anyone who would listen about how I mastered that jungle gym better than all the older kids. As I went into nursing and Grandpa started having more encounters with the healthcare system, he would always make sure to tell me about the amazing nurses that took care of him, both outpatient and hospital stays. He placed so much value in the care he received from these nurses and in turn showed me that he valued and respected my professional choices as well. Grandpa Sandy had a youthful exuberance he carried with him into his 90s. He never tired of the repetitive requests that bring children joy as evidenced by our countless outings to Dave and Buster's, the Children's Museum, the zoo, and other overpriced, crowded, sticky centers of childhood bliss. <laughs> he loved a good Curious George story and read the series multiple times to each of us, never waning in his enthusiasm. He had a playful sense of humor, often to Grandma Renee's chagrin. A favorite game, invented and instigated by Grandpa himself, involved ripping up tiny pieces of tissue <laughs> and surreptitiously placing them on Renee's coiffed hairdo with the goal of seeing how many pieces we could sneak onto her hair until she noticed. <laughs> grandpa placed utmost importance on family. For me, Grandma and Grandpa's house is full of memories of family dinners, holiday gatherings, and shared cousin bonding. At their Highland Park house, us kids felt like we were kings and queens of the palace. First stop, sprint down to the basement and claim the throne, AKA grandpa's recumbent bike. We would argue over which VHS to put in, Inspector Gadget or the Lion King, while playing with the old school bingo spinner and throwing plastic fruit at each other until we got called up for dinner. Grandpa would do anything for his grandchildren. He'd buy us extra playtime in the basement by excusing us from the kids table early to go back down to play He'd turn a blind eye when he saw me sneaking up the basement steps, across the hall, and directly into the pantry, only to shut the sliding door behind me to steal chocolate-covered raisins and lemon drops before dessert. In one of our various grandkid adventures wreaking havoc in the basement, we came across a giant poster of a young man with dark plastic-rimmed glasses. I was shocked to learn that the young man pictured was my grandfather, and even more shocked to find out that the poster was from his campaign for the Illinois State Legislature. Grandpa's stories of his various career exploits, aspiring politician, cookie salesman, accountant, entrepreneur, to name a few, provided me with an alternative narrative to the one I absorbed from society, that you should know what kind of career you want to have from a young age, and then you pursue said career and work at it for the entirety of your adult life. And somewhat paradoxically, Grandpa's pride and self-assuredness apply just as equally to his less fruitful career attempts as to his more financially successful ones. He expressed no shame in not making it to the state legislature or that the cookie business didn't pan out. Just a few weeks ago, he proudly showed me an original Rum Cub Cubby's cookie tin he still had. Through his life experiences, Grandpa modeled for me that it's okay not to know exactly where you're going, that trying new experiences and taking risks is encouraged, and that failures, career or otherwise, are nothing to be ashamed of and could even be turned into bragging rights. Grandpa's intellectual curiosity and love of learning will live on in me. I think of Grandpa in his office working on the Tribune's word jumble and pencil. I remember one day when looking over his shoulder, I figured out one of the words and he turned to me, beaming. I continued to finesse my word game craft over the years and whenever I visited, Grandpa Sandy let me co-jumble with him. I think of him when I do the jumble each morning and honor his self-confidence by doing it in pen. <laughs> uh, 
um, when I was seven or eight years old, uh, my grandpa asked me where I wanted to go to college. Um, and uh, having my uh, flag football team just come in second place, um, I was planning for my future career as a star athlete. And I asked my grandpa, well, what schools have good football teams? And he mentioned University of Georgia. Um, and just like that, I became a Bulldog fan, briefly. Don't worry, John and Doug, I still root for Michigan in the playoffs. Um, but I don't know, it's a, it's a small memory, but I think it stands out because it was the only time in my grandpa's life that he ever recommended a school other than Wash U. Um, he was obviously incredibly proud of his alma mater, um, a feeling that he really tried and admittedly failed to instill in either of his children or in any of his first three grandchildren. Um, so as the youngest, it fell to me and his grandniece, Rachel, um, to continue the bank legacy at Wash U. Um, and in my mind, how can I not? The way that he described his time there on the campus with his classmates, uh, it really was an enviable amount of passion, and he described it in a way I'd never heard anyone describe their college experience. Uh, and in the end, he was right. It really was the perfect school for me, uh, and it was, uh, that's exactly what I told him when he was handing me my diploma on stage at my graduation, giving it the biggest bear hug of my life. Uh, it really is a humbling and heartwarming experience to be on the receiving end of Sandy's pride, uh, and it's that specific moment I'll always remember. Um, I did also love seeing how truly giddy he would get whenever he actually visited me on campus. Uh, he loved talking to random administrators, uh, proudly introducing himself to total strangers as Andy's grandfather, and promptly inviting them to have dinner with us, um, and telling me college stories that he uh, made me swear to never repeat at his funeral. <laughs> what really made him happiest, I think, though, was visiting his old uh, ZBT house um, on campus. Uh, he'd always say that it hadn't changed a bit which in hindsight is a little concerning, seeing as my junior year that house got condemned by the city of St. Louis for what they said, and I quote, being unsafe, unfit, and unlawful. Um, based on the stories that you told me, mostly accurate, I would say. Uh, Grandpa would always open every visit and close every visit by asking me if there was anything else he could do for me. Uh, it was clear that he truly wanted me to have the exact same college experience that he had at WashU. Um, and while the modern Missouri state laws make that a little difficult to have the exact same experience that he had, um, it really was a fantastic four years. Uh, and I'm so happy that I was able to share that connection with him, uh, the same connection that he shared with his father. Um, family and legacy were two concepts that were very important to Sandy. And I don't think I fully appreciated their power until uh, I saw the look in his eye when he was handing me my diploma. Um, now, thanks to Grandpa, I can't wait to dress my future kids in red and green onesies and share my pride with them even if they choose to go to Tufts. <laughs> Grandpa, we will miss you. We will carry your legacy through our gregariousness, sense of self-worth, love of learning, and embrace of family. Your love for us was boundless, and we will forever hold dear the affection with which you showered us our entire lives. Thank you. We love you. In the Bible, in the book of Job, Job cries out in his sorrow. Adonai Natan Adonai Rakach Yehishem Adonai Mevarach. God has given, God has taken away. Blessed be the name of God. In ancient people were well acquainted with grief and with the valley of shadows. Death and sorrow are not strangers to us. Yet the centuries have taught us that a good name endures beyond the grave, and that there is strength in faith. So with Job, we say, Adonai Natan, God, you have given. You gave us Sandy, a loved one who will not be forgotten. For all that was good and enduring in his life, we offer the deepest thanks of our hearts. Adonai Lakach, God, you have taken away. We pray for the strength to turn our broken hearts into an altar of trust, before which we acknowledge your sovereignty and your love as we say, Yehi Shem Adonai Mevarach, blessed be the name of God now and forever. We pause for a moment of private prayer, or meditation, or memory. To think about Sandy, perhaps to think about how you may comfort his family, to think about what he meant in each of our lives. We pause for a moment of private prayer.
May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. We've gathered here today to honor the memory of Sandy Bank, whose spirit has entered eternity. You knew Sandy. If you didn't know him now from the stories told by his beloved and loving sons, John and Doug, and his grandchildren, Nikki, Jordan, Kara, and Andrew, you know him now. There's not much that I can add, but as a rabbi, that won't stop me. <laughs> I just have a story or two to tell. Sandy and Renee joined Lakeside Congregation, now Makom Solel Lakeside, to see to it that their boys got a Jewish education as long as it didn't interfere with Bears games. <laughs> but then they stayed members and stayed involved for more than half a century. I met Sandy and Renee about 25 years ago when I first came to Highland Park. They made it clear to me that Sandy was the theist and Renee was the atheist, who would sometimes accompany Sandy to Holy Day services. I assured them that there's a long line of skeptics with Jewish hearts and souls. That's true even on a day like today. Sandy believed in God. He was proud of his Judaism. His belief was not naive. He recognized that in his life, after his brother and sister-in-law died untimely deaths, that he needed faith in order to go on. Sandy found strength and courage in the prayers. He found comfort in Yisker in the sound of the Kaddish, in the belief that the soul is enduring and indestructible even though the body is finite. Perhaps we can find comfort in that thought today too. Sandy certainly made his life here on earth count. He was the rock on which so many people, family, friends, community organizations, our congregation could depend. Though he is gone, Sandy will not be forgotten by anyone whose path he crossed. His soul has gone on to another dimension. I will remember many conversations with Sandy, some serious about God and faith, many you might call frivolous, although we never treated them frivolously about great Jews in sports. <laughs> Sandy enjoyed my collection of Jewish athletes' autographs and memorabilia, and I enjoyed giving him a tour of my collection. We had a lot of laughs remembering some of the greats and not so greats of Jewish sports history. He was certainly enamored with Sandy Koufax, with whom he shared a name. Of course, Sandy was sure to tell me he was already Sandy before anyone had ever heard of Koufax. Sandy had a few great loves. Renee, of course, who he met on a double date with somebody else. They have been true partners through thick and thin and ups and downs for more than 64 years. And Sandy loved his whole family. He loved his children and grandchildren, had a special connection to his nieces and nephews. They meant so much to him as well, Myra, Alan, and Elliot, and their families. These were some of the great loves of his life. He loved the charities he supported, but of course had that special love for Washington University. When you finally decided to attend Wash U, Sandy finally had a relative attending the school he loved. He came, made a special trip to the synagogue just to tell me. <laughs> he believed it was a true act of God, <laughs> a kind of Jewish version of karma or something that this wish of his finally came true. There was a glint in Sandy's eye when he talked about it that was only rivaled when he talked about the great days of the Chicago Bears. For years, Sandy and Renee have been part of a small group of congregational members who supported the community above and beyond regular membership. They came faithfully to our rabbi's table dinners and often remarked about how nice it was to see all the young couples stepping up to take care of the congregation. Never mind that many of those young couples were already eligible for Social Security. <laughs> Age is relative. And for Sandy and Renee, it was great to see that something they had helped build was thriving into the 21st century. My last memory of Sandy was at the height of COVID, when people were keeping their distance, 
but Sandy came in to make his annual financial commitment to the congregation. He could have mailed it, but he wanted to be in the building. It was something he was missing in the time of pandemic. In those months when everyone was masked and keeping their distance, Sandy leaned in not just for a handshake, but for a real hug. The truth was we were all missing that human contact, and I will cherish that moment always. It was beautifully transgressive in the heights of the pandemic. But Sandy was not one to stand back and not act on his feelings. He showed his caring for me, for the congregation, for his family, for the community, for the world, in everything that he did. I do want to thank those who cared for him as well. His nurse, Cynthia Rose, in these last few weeks, shared with him a, a life of affection and care. His doctor, Pat Logan, knew Sandy so well. Sandy trusted him. And surely, the doctor kept him healthy until very recently. The memory of Sanford Sandy Bank will always be a blessing to all of us who knew him. Can you hear out so? May this be God's will. Amen. In the rising of the sun and in its going down, we remember him. In the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we remember him. In the opening of buds and in the rebirth of spring, we remember him. In the rustling of leaves and in the beauty of autumn, we remember him. In the beginning of the year and when it ends, we remember him. When we are weary and in need of strength, we remember him. When we are lost and sick at heart, we remember him. When we have joys we yearn to share, we remember him. So long as we live, he too shall live, for he is now a part of us as we remember him. In fact, our tradition teaches us about two kinds of immortality. There's the immortality of the spirit, a gift from God given to us when we're born and goes back to God when we die. But there is a second kind of immortality, and that's the immortality that we bestow on those whom we love by remembering them, by telling their stories, by passing them on from one generation to the next. So long as we remember Sandy and tell his stories, he has eternal life. I ask you to stand for the ancient prayer, the El Malay Rachamim, the prayer for the immortal spirit and for the spirit that we give to those whom we love. El Malay Rachamim Shochen Bam Romim, Hamse Minuchan Nechona Tachat Kanfe Shrina, Im Kedoshim Utehorim Kazohar Harakia Mazirim, Et Nishmato Shaharacha Olamo, Baal Harachamim Yastireo Beseter Kanfavla Olamim. Vaitor bitor hahaim et nishmato, Adonai hu nahalato, Vianuach de shalom al mishkavo, and Omar. Amen. Compassionate God, eternal spirit of the universe, grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence to Sandy A. Bank, who has entered eternity. O God of mercy, let him find refuge in the shadow of your wings. Let his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is his inheritance. May he rest in peace. Let us say, Amen. Friends, this concludes the services here at the chapel. The interment and burial services will continue at Memorial Park Cemetery here in Skokie. For those of you traveling with us to the cemetery and the funeral procession, Please do keep the following safety precautions in mind. Please make sure that your bright headlights and your four-way hazard flashes are on at all times. Please be sure to obtain an orange funeral safety sticker for your windshield, and we will be providing several of the cars throughout the procession with a magnetic orange flag to be placed on top of your car. Please travel as close as safety permits to the car in front of you to avoid any gaps in the procession. And for your own safety and security, I would suggest not speaking or texting while driving to the cemetery and the funeral procession. The family will be together for Shiva at the bank residence at 1610 Forest Avenue in Highland Park upon their return from the cemetery until 8.30 p.m. And the family has also requested that any memorial contributions in his memory to the Chicago Hearing Society. And that information is also available in the service folder that you should have 
received as you entered the chapel today. If you did not receive one, they, we do have those for you as you leave. And for those of you joining us online, that information regarding Shiva, as well as the memorial contribution information is also available on our website. The following individuals have been asked to serve as pallbearers, Nikki Bank, Jordan Bank, Kara Bank, Andrew Bank, Mira Bank, Elliot Bank, and Alan Bank. At this time, I would ask everyone to please rise and stand in place. If we could ask the pallbearers to come forward to my right as we escort the casket, the family, and the rabbi from the chapel. <laughs> 